The Indy Lounge is brought to you by Flightline Financial, pilots helping pilots with their financial needs. Hi, my name is Mandy Del Rio. Welcome to the Indy Lounge. I have immense respect and appreciation for law enforcement, men and women who put their lives on the line for us every day to keep us safe. Some of them do this on a national level, like my guest, criminal profiler, forensic linguist, and former FBI agent, best known for his role in the Unabom investigation, James Fitz Fitzgerald. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's great to be here, Mandy. Thanks it's, for having me. It's great to have you. Um, you know, you have had such a quite a, a quite impressive and extensive career. Um, and um, like I mentioned, you were, you were very paramount in the Unabomber investigation. Um, I want to get into that. Um, I want to get into books you've written, um, the three books in a series, um, and also the mini-series about the Unabomber. Um, first, though, I kind of want to know how you got started um, in you know, law enforcement and then with the FBI. Uh, and that's why I wrote three books, Mandy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first book is, uh, they're all called A Journey to the Center of the Mind, one title. The first book is The Coming of Age Years. And I remember looking back in my early, mid, even late teens, going off to Penn State University, growing up in the Philadelphia area, I had no idea what I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. And I think a lot of young people go through that, even today. And I just said, I wanted to put on paper, just somehow explaining that process. And it is not just one process that everybody goes through the same way. In my case, I just found that my, my parents were always active in reading. They liked history. And they would talk about different crimes that occurred around the country when they were younger. And they told me about, for them, the crime of the century happened not too far from where we're sitting now. And that was the uh, kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby mm -hmm. in the early 1930s. And one of the first adult books I ever read, I was about 11 years old, was a book called Kidnap, and it's all about the Lindbergh kidnapping and what went right, what went wrong, what investigators did. There was actually, you know, some level of criminal profiling in it, some levels of forensic linguistics mm -hmm. involving the notes that were written. And I was fascinated about how these investigators could take this case of a missing baby. The baby was eventually found about six yeah. or eight months later dead, mm -hmm. uh, but they still put the case together, and about a year later, Bruno Hoppen was uh, arrested. And I always felt that case just fascinated me as a young boy. Other true crime issues uh, fascinated me. And then my dad had talked with me when I was in college. And he said, what do you want to do, son? I said, I'm not sure, dad. He goes, well, find something you like to do, then get someone to pay you for it. Huh. <laughs> I always like this true crime stuff. So I could either be the person committing the crimes or, <laughs> or the person solving them. Mm -hmm. And I certainly de uh, decided on the uh, latter. And I uh, got my criminal justice degree at Penn State University. My first job was as a store detective in downtown Philadelphia. Uh, from there, 11 years as a police officer in Ben Salem Township. That's the northern suburbs of Philly. I was detective, uh, well, patrol officer, detective, uh, sergeant, and then uh, a lot of politics, a lot of crazy stuff happening then. That's all in my second book, mm -hmm. uh, A Journey to the Center of the Mind, the police officer years. And then I just uh, realized about halfway through, time to move on. And the FBI was the logical place to look. Uh, I took the test, and um, in 1987, I was hired by them. And that's kind of a brief summary of my story. A lot of other detours and left and right turns in there. Right. But that's basically how it got me to the FBI. Well, that's great. And, and so it's sort of like your own curiosity kind of led you there. Uh, it's certainly good that you didn't go on the opposite side because I think you'd probably make as, as you know much of a great criminal as you do I'll, a fantastic. I think linguist. that's a compliment, <laughs> Mandy. So I'll take it as that. Yeah, but definitely. But I definitely didn't go that way. Right, right. Now, what can you explain? Um, some people don't know what uh, you know forensics. Um, I know now everyone you know thanks to the ID channel, everyone you know that's a household name now. Forensics, but can you tell me what what that actually entails? Sure. Uh, forensic is from the Latin, uh, arguing the law, I think is a loose translation. So forensic in front of any sort of field or subject matter means somehow it's involved in the legal process, the criminal justice system. Uh, forensic odontology is dentists who can look at perhaps mm -hmm. remains or bite marks and mm -hmm. determine what kind of crime was involved or whose teeth mark they are. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, all kinds of forensic accounting, forensic psychology. In my case, I am a forensic linguist. I came mm -hmm. late into that in life. 
Uh, linguistics is the scientific study of language. So it's mixing the science of language in the criminal justice system. And that's basically what I wound up employing in the Unabom case in mm -hmm. 1995 before I was a linguist, but I always had a, uh, a keen interest in, in language, in human interaction. I only speak English, a little bit of Spanish mm -hmm. when necessary. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, back to my parents, neither of them went past high school, but they, um, they definitely had me interested in, in, in reading, in history. My mother taught me how to play Scrabble at an early mm, age. I was gonna ask you that. <laughs> and crossword puzzles. Uh -huh. I got into cryptograms a little bit later in life. And I always found just the use of the English language. I was so, I, I wrote to the old evening bulletin newspaper. I think I was 12 years old. They had an answer to the queries column. And this is before digital, before anything online. I wrote them an old fashioned letter. What's the longest word in the English language? I was just curious, what was it? Mm -hmm. And they, about a month later, they didn't answer it in a paper, which disappointed me a little bit, but they sent me a typewritten letter, which I still have to this day. And it's a 45 letter word back then. I can't say it now, I couldn't possibly pronounce it, but this is my first book. Uh, okay. I actually have a copy of that oh, letter great. and the word itself. And it's not anti establishmentarianism it's a word even longer than that. So, wow. um, so that's forensic linguistics. I went back to school and got my second master's degree in linguistics at Georgetown, trying to bring, bring the, the formal science into it. And that was actually after the Unabom case. So uh, now in retirement, most of the cases I work with my company involve uh, working with law enforcement and even the private sector about how to uh, assess language matters that concern them. Could be threats, could be bloggers, could be somebody writing something they're not sure who and I do my best to try to resolve those matters. That's fantastic. I, do, I think that's a talent, and I think that's something that it, it, that sort of found you, it sounds like, instead of you kind of searching for it. Well, it was the nexus of the universe coming together with me at the Unibomb case. Yes. And after 17 years, all of a sudden there's this manifesto, right. 35,000 words, some other letters before right. that, and I just walked into it and let me look at this. Uh, this part of the whole case here and see what we can do with it. Thank and goodness. that was the big factor. Yeah, and thank goodness you did. And, you know, quickly, uh, we got to take a break in a minute, but just quickly, the Unabomber case, for those of you who don't know, which is hard to believe that there are probably kids walking around that don't know about the Unabomber, um, Ted Kaczynski, um, he, he planted, he basically sent people mail bombs and killed three people and wounded dozens of others. Um, it was terrifying. I remember, in, you know, being a young kid in nineteen, you know, in the nineteen nineties, and it was really scary. Um, and um, but I just wanted to kind of, we just had to recap who the Unabomber, sure. you know, we is. didn't know it was Ted Kaczynski for of the course, first seventeen right, years. Right, right. Uh, just and <laughs> the FBI not. gave the acronym Unabom, University Airline Bombings, because the earliest victims involved universities as well as airlines, and then yep. he expanded beyond that as he. Uh, progressed yeah. in his bombing career. Yeah, yeah, and we'll definitely get into that more in the next segment. Um, and I wanna talk more about the, the mini-series Uni, uh, Manhunt Unibom, Unibomber. Um, so we're gonna take a short break. Um, when we come back, more with uh, Jim, uh, James Fitz, Fitzgerald, <laughs> nickname Fitz. So um, we'll come back and talk more, thank you. So we're back with Fitz, and um, I want to get into, first of all, who started calling you Fitz? I got to know that. Um, that is such a great nickname. I mean, I know I was, it's part of your name, but. I have three older sisters and, of course, parents, and they would call me Jimmy as a little boy. But I think once I went off to school, somehow Fitz came up. And it's always nice to have sort of a built-in neutral nickname. Yeah, I wasn't, right? you know, Freckles or <laughs> yeah. Chunky or right. any name like that. So yeah. Fitz stuck with me my whole life, and uh, and they they the writers loved it on uh, the whole, you know, miniseries. So right. uh, Sam Worthington, the actor, he became Fitz for about the six months he worked on the on the series. Yes, I want to talk about that. Um, now, you had, so Sam Worthington of Avatar um, played you. Um, what was that like? Uh, were you on set every day? Not every day. Um, when Sam was first cast, uh, I guess it was um, uh, December or so of 16, he reached out for me right away. 
and we shared a few emails. I had about 30 questions he wanted to ask me, and they were very specific uh, to me, and I answered them, and I, I do some public speaking now, and I go through some of the questions, and it is kind of strange to have, you know someone's going to be playing you on either a movie or TV, and all of a sudden they want to hang out with you and do different things. I didn't know what to expect. In his case, he wanted to kind of keep the role from his own perspective, but he did want some Q&A from me. You know, what were the best things of my life, the worst things? Uh, what would I say to Ted Kaczynski the first time I met him? Am I left-handed, right-handed? What are my favorite foods? Am I spiritual, religious, all these things? So wow. he wanted to really cross sort of the spectrum of my personality and my, I guess, behavioral characteristics. He was, he was playing a profiler on TV, mm -hmm. so he was asking me some profiling-related questions, and I did, I did my best to, to answer them. Um, I didn't meet him until on the set uh, in April of 17 in Atlanta. And uh, we had a you know, nice conversation there. And the only thing, he's like, I hope I'm doing you well. So the only thing, Sam, is you're wearing your gun on the right side. I'm a lefty. He's there, I know, we discussed that, Fitz. Of course, he's Australian. Right. So he goes right from Fitz's Philadelphia dialect into Australian. I'm gonna try to mimic it here. <laughs> but a uh, few mates in there. Uh -huh. uh, but he's like, that's the one thing we talked about, but no, I'm righty, so we're gonna keep it on the right side. So I said, I think I can live with that. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and, and but I would go through the scripts and I would, I won't say correct them, but I would give them edits of what worked, what didn't work, some things we argued a little bit about. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the, as with any Hollywood production based on true events, uh, it's a scripted series. It's, uh, it's not a documentary. So they did mm -hmm. insert some fictionalized scenes, uh, some dramatic license. I say on the whole, it's about 85% accurate. I was gonna the ask parts you. about the language analysis in which I headed mm -hmm. and I had a team working with me, they covered that really well, the whole mm. water for water thing. Right, uh, right. Uh, or Let's actually talk vice about versa. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that happened in real life. And okay. I was born and raised in Philly, uh, mm -hmm. joined the FBI in 87. My first office was New York City. So I would, I would drive every day, two hours north, two hours south oh, afterwards. My goodness. And that was my choice. It worked for me and my family at the time. Right. But I'm leaving one, as I learned later in life in my linguistics courses at Georgetown, I'm leaving one dialect region, uh, Philly, and right. going to another. And, uh, and, and you know, I would pick up the different ways people talk there. Mm -hmm. And eventually they shipped me to San Francisco for mm -hmm. supposed to be 30 days. I'm a brand new profiler now. Okay. This is 1995. And I just finished 12 weeks of profiling school at the FBI Academy. And they shipped me out to San Francisco. And um, did they do that, bra? <laughs> they did. And uh, and that's when language really. Uh -huh. I, you know, Philly and New York have their own features, but um, but you really, it's much more pronounced in California mm -hmm. in terms of when you stick out like a sore thumb. Right. No pun intended with the pronounced. <laughs> so uh, within a week there, I think I did ask someone, "Where's the?" water fountain or where can I get a bottle of water? And, ah, you must be from New York. I said, no, I'm from Philly, but interesting you bring that up. So you picked up that I was at least from East Coast, Mid-Atlantic uh -huh. States. Yeah, so, and we have this manifesto here. It's not spoken language, it's written language. I wonder if we can figure out some of that stuff from here. And that's when I got to work and I impressed one of the bosses there because in a 1985 letter, just like shown in the series, mm -hmm. there was a, I picked out that nobody saw this before, this was 10 years later, Dad, it is I, down the left-hand column right. of one of the letters. And I said, this may be a secret message this guy is writing, or even a subconscious message, and no one had seen this before. They did all their fingerprint examination of the letter, indented writing, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the Dad, it is I, the little secret message was never found. I did, and they said, Fitz, you're in charge of all the documents from this point on. So I can do that. I'm a long-term investigator as a police officer, FBI agent in New York. I'm now a newly trained profiler, but they're having me basically focus on the language in the, uh, in the manifesto and the 13 letters that preceded it. I said, I can do this, and actually that is help, what helped eventually solve the case. That's amazing, and that has to do with, I think, uh, the way you hear things too. It sounds like you're very precise when it comes to language. And why I said bra is because obviously in this in the in the you know the TV the the series, um, it, you your character catches that with the San Francisco language, and I say that because I'm actually from the Bay Area myself. Oh. So I, I've actually I was laughing when we watched it. My my fiance is Philly. Uh, his family's from Philly, 
<clears throat> and and I'm from California, the Bay Area. So it was really funny. We had a chuckle about the water and the bra because he didn't know that that's how people say bro in the Bay Area. So it, it it's funny that you know the, these two places and. It, it, it's very true that when we hear East Coast kind of all sounds the same to us. You know, I, I would probably think New York, Philly also. You know, I'd put that together. But um, what's amazing to me is that, that, that you picked up on that. You know, that is, that's yeah, I mean, fascinating. Other people, and I was always aware of the difference in, in, you know, I mean, from Boston all the way down the East Coast, because the Europeans first came to the East Coast, right. and they came from different countries, different parts of their countries, and they had settled in, and that's how the dialects and the accents stayed there. They moved west and the accents are a little more dispersed, if you will, but there are certain lexical features in Northern California, Southern California. And I said, you know what? The bottom line is here, the Unabomber's not talking to us, right. but he's writing. He mm -hmm. gave us a gift. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get anything off the bombs. They were perfectly designed right. to be um, without any fingerprints on them, without any clues, any evidence whatsoever. 17 years, mm -hmm. he succeeded with that. Now we have this fresh batch of writings. I said, there's got to be a clue in here. And the bottom line is, I said, we've got to get this thing published. He wants it published. He said, he'll stop killing people if he does it. Let's do it. A few people were on my side. A few people weren't at the mm -hmm. Unibom Task Force Management. And I basically, along with a few others, argued that issue. And we finally said, all right, we'll agree to publish it. We called... Uh, the Department of Justice, and Janet mm -hmm. Reno was the Attorney General then, of course, Louis Free, the FBI Director, they basically agreed with it. Then we had to get the New York Times to agree, right. then we actually get the Washington Post to agree, and anybody, uh, at, at, at some point, everybody agreed, and it was published in September of 95, and it took a few months, but by February of 96, we had our prime suspect. I was in, and. and Thank goodness again, like because that was a very scary time, and um, you know, I, I I was reading and watching a lot of your interviews and the way you go through all of this, and you actually teach. Do you teach how to do this stuff? I do. I'm adjunct faculty at uh, Stockton University here in New Jersey, okay. as well as Hofstra University in Long Island, New York, and I do uh, teach forensic linguistics every spring at Hofstra University. We do a one week course, okay. and I do specialized training around the country around the world actually, law enforcement, private sector, for folks who want uh, several days or even upwards of a week of training in that field. So uh, uh, it's, uh, it's still kind of a new science and used mm -hmm. in the courts and people aren't exactly how to use it. There's some people who really know what they're doing that I've learned from. I would put myself humbly in that category, mm -hmm. but there are some other people out there that uh, uh, you gotta be careful when, when using those two. So it's, uh, it's a field that's up and coming, and there's uh, actually programs in the U.S. and around the world now in forensic linguistics. And we always uh, we always need more linguists out there. So yeah. if uh, anyone is interested, they imagine. should look up some of those programs. Yeah, absolutely. And is and you have information on your website? Yeah, uh, jamesrfitzgerald.com uh, about where I you know, speaking engagements and my training, whatever, and my book information. So it's all there. And right. uh, um, just last week, I was at Georgetown University giving a lecture in a forensic linguistics course. I'll be at Hofstra in March and I'm at Stockton, uh, I believe in April. So yeah, I have a lot, lot of things of going on That's in great. terms of forensic linguistics and as well as talking about my books and great. life and all that entails. Yeah. And then we're going to take a break and then we come back, we'll talk more about um, like what you're doing now and, sure. and about, you know, the other, you've done other TV series and things like that. So we'll talk more about that when we come back. Okay, Mandy. Okay. We will be right back. Stay with us. More with James Fitzgerald. And we're back with James Fitzgerald. I want to get into your other projects. Uh, I know you've worked on uh, with Criminal Minds. Um, and you've done killer profiles. So let, let's talk about what else you've done. Yeah, I was still in the FBI um, in LA giving a, uh, at a conference in the summer of 2007. And I, uh, a friend of mine, Jim Clemente, also in the FBI, now also retired. Uh, he's one of the uh, co-creators of Manhunt Unabomber and one of the writers. We met with people from Criminal Minds and basically I was retiring in about four months. They said, Fitz, you want a job? We need a technical advisor. And this was the, they hadn't started their third season yet. Mandy Patankin had just quit and they just hired Joe Montagna. So I said, uh, yeah, I wasn't quite ready to move to LA at that time. 
uh, for some personal reasons. So they said, that's fine. You can do it by email and by phone. Okay. Oh, so they wow. made a nice little offer per episode. And uh, basically every script was sent to me and I would get on the phone or email with the, with the writers and say, you know, I'd always compliment them, say, you know, it's great what you have here, but maybe you can tighten it up a little bit here, a little bit there. And they very much appreciate having a real FBI agent, or at least just recently retired, add this realism to, uh, to their shows. And I still say to this day, Criminal Minds, of course, everything's solved in 42 minutes minus commercials. And there's a few car chases and fist fights and shootouts that most pro fighters don't get into <laughs> once you're at that point in your career. But other than that, they try to keep the... Um, uh, the science behind profiling and the terminology and the, the contextual elements of different crimes uh, true to form. And they base mm. them on some real cases that we've actually worked over the years. So, uh, uh, and my friend Jim Clemente is now one of the writers on the show and uh, he keeps it real too. So that That's was my great. first foray into Hollywood, coming out into the studio. We actually helped create the season nine and 10 character, Alex Blake, played by Jean Triplehorn. Uh -huh. She was based on my partner who is a forensic linguist at Georgetown University, but then they also had her help solve the Unabom case as a rookie, which oh, was kind wow. of me too. So she was a hybrid character. Right, right. And, uh, and, and I guess, and a few other stories, uh, storylines I gave them there. So, and then that just sort of morphed. My friend Jim uh, retired. He's very, he moved to LA. Uh, he's very much into the Hollywood scene. He started mm -hmm. his own company, XG Productions. I'm associated with them now. Oh, great. And the next show we did was Killer Profile. We actually did that in Philadelphia. Oh with our friend Laura Richards who came from the UK and the three of us did a bunch of different episodes on different serial killers in the US. And then um, uh, the case of John Benet Ramsey was in 2016. Mm -hmm. And in April of 2018, coming up, the case of Kaylee Anthony, the little girl yeah. in, uh, in near Orlando, Florida, who was killed. Uh, her mother was arrested and tried and acquitted, Casey Anthony. Mm -hmm. So that'll be on the air uh, come April what do you do exactly on that? Um... It's a very similar format, uh, Mandy, to uh, the case of John Benet Ramsey. Okay. We actually go to the area that everything was filmed in the exact area where uh, the murder occurred, the trial, and, and what have you. Great. Um, I made three separate trips to Florida. I'm kind of one of the resident experts. I do a lot of work with the language analysis, the 911 calls. There was a suicide letter written by George Anthony. Mm -hmm. uh, he, mm -hmm. he didn't actually right. kill himself, but the letter has a lot of valuable information. And so okay. this will all be presented to the public yeah. and we will lay out the case into what we think really happened and oh, maybe what wait. should have happened, whatever. So okay. uh, that's coming up uh, in the spring of 18. I also Good. worked on a show for Reels Network uh, called Notorious and uh, it's 10 episodes and I'm on each episode as one of the experts, uh, co-hosts, if you will. And uh, it's a very eclectic mix of uh, people that we discussed. Ted Kaczynski is one of them. Mm -hmm. D.B. Cooper, the hijacker from the early 70s, is mm -hmm. another. Jared Fogel is another person. Anthony oh, right. Weiner, mm -hmm. the politician from New York State. Oh, wow. Uh, the one woman who ever he um, headed a drug cartel uh, in the U.S. Her name was uh, Blanco from the uh, early 80s. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting mix, uh, Patty Hearst case. So every episode is a kind of a famous case, but maybe that people don't know all the facts about, and we're going to bring it out for them there, so. People love this stuff. You know, I know that we have, we have the ID channel on, on our house quite a bit. <laughs> and, and I don't know, if, is it, do you think it's morbid curiosity? Do you think people want to know what go, you know, the psychology? It could be a mix of different things, but. So in uh, last year, I went to the first crime con. Mm, it was in was, Indianapolis um, and it was a three day event. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, it was mostly women. I'd say 80 to 85% mm of the uh, attendees over three days were women from all around the U.S. And, all, and other parts of the world. This year it's going to be in May in Nashville, Tennessee, CrimeCon 18. Okay. I'll, be, uh, I'll be giving a talk there, uh, tying it into Manhunt Unabomber in my career and some of the things we talked about here, mm -hmm. some other things. And, uh, and I know once again it's probably going to be mostly female. And that's the demographics of a lot of these shows. Hmm. You said morbid curiosity, um, you know, is it um, you know, the rubbernecking effect and an accident scene when you're driving by. And I, I think in many cases, and when I try to do talks, and when I try to, uh, you know, present shows, uh, or, or I'm a host of a show, somehow I want to get in there. Here's how you, the viewer, can avoid being a victim. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of women in, <laughs> in society are uh -huh. concerned about that yeah. um, because women of violent crimes, 
statistically speaking, tend to be the victims. Mm -hmm. Statistically, men tend to be the uh, offenders. Mm -hmm. So I think in many cases, uh, women do want to see these kind of shows, not because they enjoy hearing about some other victims, uh, you know, murder or rape or whatever it may have been, but maybe somehow they can learn something from yeah. it and say, I won't put myself in that situation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't help it in life, as we mm -hmm. all know, but we always try to impart something. Even if we don't do it directly on the air, in, in maybe follow-up interviews or online type of situations, we'll say, hey, here's how you prevent yourself from right. falling into that sort of situation. Right, absolutely. That's 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 mainly why I like to watch them, and I like my daughter to watch them, too, to keep you know your head on your shoulders. And Like you said, there's only so much you can do, but um, whatever you can do. Um, and my other question to you is, you know, we we see these sensationalized cases like Jean Benet and, and Kay, little Kaylee Anthony. And, you know, what's unfortunate is that I feel like sometimes people lose sight of, of the individual, like especially within Jean Benet because she was in the pageant and um, people have really, I, I feel like, separated from that. What is your take on that? Yeah, for um, legal purposes, I can't discuss the John Benet case oh, I see. Okay. today. Gotcha. Um, uh, but in terms of um, other factors, I mean, look, there was no, there were no children involved in the in the uh, OJ case. Right, uh, right. You know, it was an attractive blonde and her friend. Mm -hmm. And of course, OJ was a celebrity, uh, you know, former football player, whatever. Right. So that certainly adds to the mystique to all right. this. We're realistic. You know, there are a lot of little minority girls that probably get killed and, and girls of color that don't get the headlines that the quote unquote pretty blondes get mm. who are in beauty pageants mm -hmm. or who have some nice, you know, uh, still shot pictures that, that they can put on the front of you know, some, um, you know, supermarket magazine covers. And that tends to be what attracts more people. That tends to be what the media is attracted to. So uh, every case is, uh, as a profiler, mm -hmm. as an investigator before that, as a detective, uh, I always kept the victim in mind. I always wanted yeah. a picture, not just of the body. Of course, I needed those to help right. analyze the case. Right. Sometimes I was on the scene with the body still there. Right. But I always asked the family for a picture, adult, child, Male, female, didn't mm -hmm. matter. I want the most recent picture from their school pageant or yeah. home studio, whatever they have, and that was on the front cover of my folder. Mm -hmm. And that reminded me, this is a person, this was a live living being who yeah. had every right to continue living. Somebody out there took that life away for whatever yeah. reason. And that was my job, uh, either directly as an FBI agent detective or as a profiler sort of helping other agents and detectives to put that case together. Right. So uh, that's how I try to work it and keep that person's yeah. living uh, memory in my mind and then try to focus on that and work right, backwards. Right, right. And that must be really hard. That must be challenging sometimes. Especially with children. And, yeah, and I course. have three children myself and yeah. now my first grandchild. And I oh, mean, that's, uh, thanks. And it's, uh, and I always, you know, I worried about those things all these years. And, um, and um, but, you know, again, common sense and mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, and now that my son's a parent and, you know, mm -hmm. remind him of, of different things every once in a while that they have to keep in mind. But yeah. they're doing a great job already. And, and like I said, I, I hope that your viewing audience, too, it's yeah. uh, when the little hairs in the back of your neck stand up, you know, evolution gave that to us. Yeah. That probably means there's something not right in your immediate environment and you got to do the right thing. Maybe just yell Absolutely. or go to your car, lock yourself in your house, whatever, and go from there. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today and for all that you do. You know, just a big thank you for what you've done on every case you've worked on and um, especially the Unabomber case. Um, You're welcome, Andy. Thanks yeah. for having me here. Well, thank you so much for joining us today at the Indie Lounge. Um, you can go to IndieLoungeTV.com. Uh, indie you can see all of our episodes and more information about me um, and our guests. Um, follow me on Twitter at Indie Lounge TV and Facebook Indie Lounge TV. Um, do you have any a Twitter handle? Uh, at J Fitz Journey. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next time. Mm -hmm.